Um, last question. Um, how high a price should one pay to do good in the world? You're talking about risks? Risk and, you know, ultimate sacrifices, you know. Those people who travel into dangerous areas should do so fully aware that they're taking a great risks. But life is always risks. The important thing is not to be reckless. My name is Sultan Al Muthiri, a protocol science student at James Madison University. It is my honor to be making this presentation on the late Richard Holbrook, one of the finest examples of American diplomacy. Richard Holbrook rose to everlasting fame for his international peace building efforts in conflict zone worldwide, especially Bosnia where his success ended a violent war that lasted for three and a half years. Richard's practical rhetoric and ideology has inspired me to take him up as a rule modern and also explore his methods for my own career in diplomacy. Despite his untimely death, Richard will remain a strong pillar of American political diplomacy and the world will remember him as a peace-building legend. In the early 1960s, the United States was involved in anti-communist efforts in Vietnam. Holberg arrived in Vietnam in 1963 to begin his career in international politics as a young foreign service officer. He was sent to So Trong, a dangerous region where he was the only American civilians working. He was signed for the pacification program, an American civilian initiative to help win the Vietnam War. He worked with the local villagers, building school and developing agriculture. Your father very quickly understood that if you couldn't pacify the country, in other words, politically mobilize the population, break it away from the Vietnamese communists, produce an economic solution, no number of soldiers were going to solve the problem. Richard also realized very soon that the senior officials in Washington were not seeing the reality of the situation in Vietnam, particularly the death and the carnage left behind by the Viet Cong raids. He knew that the policy decisions being made were ignorant of the truth. This was a big part of who he was. Don't make those kinds of policy decisions that are driven by lack of connection to reality and that are wholly ideological. Your father passionately believed that pacification was being done absolutely the wrong way. Richard always was in the middle of the action, wanting to influence decisions being made by the government's officials in Washington. At just 25 years of age, Richard coyly argued against the entire U.S. government regarding the method being used in Vietnam. There was nothing wrong with our cause in Vietnam. Those of us who signed up or were sent there did not question our goal. But sometimes even the world's greatest power can't achieve its goal. When we send our young men and women overseas to fight for their country, we must be sure they're really fighting for our vital national security interests. And so we failed the first test. Our beloved nation sent into battle soldiers without a clear determination of what they could accomplish, and they misjudged the stakes. Success was not achievable. He learned the need to establish some relationship between our military objectives and our political objectives. He wasn't opposed to the use of military force, but he was opposed to the use of military force to which you couldn't assign a political purpose. So he became convinced that the war had to be ended. Even though initial peace negotiation with the North Vietnamese delegates under Johnson administration failed, 
Holberg was right about the fact that the war in Vietnam indeed has to be ended. United States failure to achieve its anti-communist objectives in Vietnam, despite a massive military efforts, lads testimony to his perspective. It was Richard Hertburg's genius application of Frederick in solving the Spalkin crisis that shot him to celebrity status as diplomat. In the 1994, the Clinton administration appointed him as Assistant Secretary of State for Europe. The whole idea was to make this newly free Europe after the Cold War united, democratic, and peaceful. And the Balkans were the big obstacles there. In fact, just two years before his appointment as assistant secretary, Richard traveled to Bosnia and he had seen the war himself on its early stages. The city of Sarajevo was at the center of a horrific civil war and under siege by Serbian forces. There were actual concentration camps and rape camps that had been established where simply on the grounds of ethnicity or religion, folks were rounded up in the hundreds, in the thousands, and systematically brutalized. The issue, seen from here, was pretty simple. Yugoslavia had broken up. The Serbs reckoned that Bosnia belonged to them. They drove out 750,000 Muslims in the first few months of the war, and they killed them pretty systematically. So far, it's a victory for the Serbs under the charismatic leader, Slobodan Milosevic. Milosevic was a high-powered, young communist. He was very, very smart, and he was ruthless in getting what he wanted. Greater Serbia. Yeah. He was like a Hitler. Imagine what it was like to be seeing this and people just we're ready to let it carry on. The mantra of the world was that this is centuries of ethnic hatred, we can't do anything about it. And that was bullshit. A complete, yeah, because for decades these people had lived together and um, it wasn't a civil war, it was a genocide. By July 1995, the town of Sopranitz had been overrun by Bosnian forces. The town Muslims were driven out, and around 8,000 Muslim civilian men had been gone down in cold blood. Tension snapped at this point. President Clinton decided to begin a final all-out negotiation effort to push for peace in the Balkan, and Richard Horborg was the automatic choice to lead the diplomacy efforts. Rhetoric was aggressive in the case of Bosnia, and Hortburg pushed for aggressive policy to end the Serbian atrocities. The phrase was diplomacy backed by force. When the use of force or the willingness to threaten credibly the use of force is unavoidable, in Bosnia, confronted by a small group of Bosnian Serbs, not all the Serbs, but a small group of Bosnian Serbs who were evil people, genuinely evil, confronting true evil, you had to be able to stand up to it. On August 27, 1995, following the Sopranica massacre, Richard issued a warning statement to the Serb. If this peace initiative does not get moving, one way or another, NATO will be heavily involved, and the Serbs don't want that. The very next day, almost out of and deliberate, respond to that warning. A Bosnian Serb motor shell explosion had killed at least 35 people in a marketplace in Sarajevo. As warned before, Richard called for NATO action. As Sarajevo slept, NATO warplanes began the bombardment. If anyone doubts the resolve of NATO and the United States, they should only look at what happened last week. He knew that he had to say to the Serbs, enough. I remember once he was going to Belgrade to see Milosevic. We look forward today to important and productive talks with President Milosevic. And the bombing was supposed to resume the next day. Thank you very much. And he thought to himself, should we stop the bombing? Because I'm going to see him. You know, will this send the wrong signal? And then he thought, no, the signal we must send is this is not going to stop. I'm coming to see you. I'm going to hit you at the same time. See how you like that. You're going to have dinner tonight in Belgrade with President Milosevic. Do you trust him? My job isn't to trust. My job is to negotiate. 
Following Astronomer's campaign of aggressive talks, real progress was finally being made. All the real issues are finally being negotiated for the first time in 16 months. We're talking about the map, about constitutional issues, about economic reconstruction. Of course, we are making progress. I think we've made a little progress and... Uh, right. Milosevic uh, realized he could not prevail. Thank you. I will report to President Clinton and... That we were not going to permit it and we weren't going to allow him to continue to kill people at random. I'm pleased to announce that the parties in Bosnia have agreed to a ceasefire. And that's basically what got us to Dayton. Richard followed up with a pure genius by arranging a subsequent peace talks in the United States. The three Balkan presidents, Milosevic of Serbia, Izabigus of Bosnia, and Tugman of Croatia, were flown to Dayton, Ohio, to negotiate a peace agreement. And Richard were under tremendous pressure to make it work. The most bitter of enemies will sit down with negotiators to try to bury their differences as they have their dead. If Dayton and the peace process do not succeed, the country will slip back into war. Milosevic and the Serbs have been the aggressors throughout the war. Yet Aliyah Izbegovic, the founder and president of Bosnia, had made recent gains on the battlefield and was deeply conflicted about making peace. 20 days into the peace talks, the negotiations had boiled down into one critical issue, territorial redistribution. Arguments raised on, maps were drawn and redrawn several times, and yet a mutual agreement could not be reached. Izabegovic was against the idea of the Serbs gaining more territory, since they were the prime aggressors in the conflict. And so he remained reluctant to make peace. As frustrations grew, the American negotiators asked the parties to either complete the deal by nightfall or return back to their home countries. Three weeks after their first handshakes, the bitter enemies were locked in non-stop arguments. The United States has already told the Balkan delegations the talks will end in a few hours. Time had run out. We had to see Izabegovic. There was a long, agonizing pause. We watched Izabegovic carefully. No one spoke. Finally, speaking slowly, Izabegovic said, it is not a just peace, but my people need peace. After four years of bloody conflict, a peace agreement had finally been reached. People who doubted American leadership, they saw it once again in Dayton. To people who doubted the American commitment to human rights, they saw it in Dayton. And I'm personally very proud to have been part of it. In 2009, Richard was appointed by Obama administration for diplomacy efforts in Afghanistan and Pakistan. I next have the great personal pleasure of introducing the Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan. Ambassador Holbrook will coordinate across the entire government an effort to achieve United States strategic goals in the region. In 2001, the United States launched all-out anti-Taliban airstrike in Afghanistan in retaliation to the 9-11 attacks. The Taliban collapsed very quick and withdrew. After the little golden period after the Taliban left, when everything seemed possible, the United States failed to explain to the Afghan people what they were doing there. As civilian casualties became a dominant issue and the U.S. made no adequate explanation of why we were there, things began to turn in an unpleasant way. By 2006, 2007, the Taliban were back in a big way and mounted the first big offensives. When your father came in 2009, that's what he inherited. He inherited, at that point, eight years of neglect and of mismanagement. This is tough work. It's the toughest job I've ever had. There was a big gap in our military commitment and our diplomatic commitment in Afghanistan. If we didn't make a full 
press on the diplomatic front, we wouldn't know whether or not there could be some kind of negotiated ending. At the time of Holtberg appointment in 2009, the U.S. military was still dominating the political strategy in Afghanistan, despite all the chaos. Even after a comprehensive review of the U.S. foreign policy in Afghanistan and the past mismanagement in the region, the administration's resolve was simply another military surge. This review is now complete, and as Commander-in-Chief, I have determined that it is in our vital national interest to send an additional 30,000 U.S. troops to Afghanistan. Richard was strongly opposed against military search, yet he remained very secretive about his opinion. I have serious concerns about the fact that our troops are going to be spread too thin and that I'm most afraid that we'll get into a resource mission mismatch. This is based on my own experience. A lot of people thought I was overly influenced by that. Richard pursued a civilian search. He didn't like the idea of military dictating political terms. He wanted to make sure that the civilians are dominant in the peace process. He worked to achieve this by investing funds in the education of Afghani youth. He further wanted to reach a protocol settlement by negotiating with the Taliban. This conflicted with the U.S. strict policy of no negotiating with terrorism. He started recording what he really thought about U.S. strategy in Afghanistan. I am supporting direct talks with Taliban. They've indicated a readiness to talk. I'm sure they'll take a tough line at the beginning. That's what negotiations are about. Petraeus is strongly opposing all this. He says he wants to do it only when the time is right, which he says will be next year by which time he'll have had more military success. Frankly, I just don't believe him. There was strong opposition in Obama administration against Richard's idea to reconcile with Taliban. Conflicting ideologies and political disagreements made it extremely hard for Richard to push for political settlement in Afghanistan. His voice under Obama administration seemed reduced and he felt he was losing control over the peace process. On the 10th of December 2010, Richard was scheduled to meet with Secretary Clinton at her office. He was running late. He came rushing in and I was sitting on the couch and I'd saved the big chair for him where he always sat when we had meetings uh, together. And, you know, he was saying, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. First, I met with the Pakistanis, then I went with, you know, met to, with the, the White House. But that was typical, Richard. It was like, I'm doing a million things, and I'm trying to keep all the balls in the air. And I, I look, you know, I was looking at him, and I just saw this deep red flush go up his face. And I said, Richard, what's wrong? And he, and he said, I don't know. Something's happening. I said, well, you're going to the doctor right now. I rode in the back of the ambulance with him. And we talked the whole way to the ambulance. I, get, I was holding his hand. What'd you talk about? He said, tell my kids how much I love them. Um, tell the staff that they're the best staff ever. Um, make sure that I don't die here. Um, he said, make sure that I don't die here. Yeah. Veteran diplomat Richard Holbrook has died after undergoing multiple surgeries to repair a torn aorta. Richard may have taken a lot of curse during his final days in office and may have not been around to complete his mission in Afghanistan, but that's secondary. What's important is that there are thousands of people around the world who have a future today because of the way he lived his life. Richard Holbrook will always be a one-of-a-kind diplomat. Two dancing feet, only one desire that's left in me on the whole damn world to come dance with me.